God's grace, mercy, and peace be unto you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. During this Advent season, we've been looking at the prophets and discovering their message, and in each prophet we have another clue or about what was going to happen and how God was going to intervene. And Micah is no different. And he says there, and he will be their peace. So I was taking a look at peace. And I discovered a study that was done in the late 90s where they had gathered historians together from Egypt, Germany, India, and England. And so they got their expertise all together and they started looking at peace. And they started with the year 3600 B.C. to the present day. And as they worked through it, they figured out out of all those years... Only 292 of them had been years of peace. And during that time, there had been 14,351 wars, large and small, in which 3.64 billion people had died in war. The value of the property destroyed during these wars would create a belt of gold around the middle of the earth, 97.2 miles wide and 33 feet thick. Since 650 B.C., there have been 1,656 arms races, and only 16 of them have not ended in war, and most of them ended with economic collapse. For the nations involved. Every service I've kind of taken a look around. Boy, what great news. Thanks, Pastor. Only 292 years of peace. So that really wasn't good news for me. So I started, you know, my thoughts went to Miss Congeniality. Do you know that movie? You know, she's undercover FBI, FBI agent in the Miss America contest, and she's sort of sarcastic about it. And one of the things they bring up in there is no matter what question you're asked during the beauty pageant, the answer is world peace. And then that got me thinking about my mom. Because, you know, you can ask my mom what she wants for Christmas, and she always says, world peace. Well, thanks. And on Christmas morning, you say something like, well, I hope you like the scarf because I can't do anything about world peace. And so you start looking at the prophet Micah, and he gets to this point, and you look at the first five chapters. Let me describe what he was dealing with. First of all, the nation of Israel was under siege The nation of Assyria was destroying everything and taking people into captivity. There was no peace politically. There was judgment on Israel because they had gone down the drain morally. A lot of injustice. The court system was stacked against the little guy. The kings were getting richer and the regular people were getting poorer. A lot of people were in a great deal of need. All those things were symptoms, though, of a bigger problem, and that was they were sick spiritually because they were going after things other than the true God. They had a lot of idol worship going on. There are a lot of visible sins. Does that sound familiar at all? I, 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 it almost sounds the same as today, doesn't it? Maybe a larger scale, more worldwide, I don't know. It's crazy. And then you're dealing with that whole thing, and, and you have the same things happening today, and he comes with that line in verse 5, and he will be our peace. 
Now, maybe you're not even looking at the nation trying to figure out, uh, or the world trying to figure out world peace. You're just like a little in your own life. And maybe you've gone down the road, boy, if I just had a little bit more money, I would be at peace. Or maybe if I had a husband or a wife or a family, I would be at peace. Or maybe just if during the holidays they'd talk to each other, I'd have a little bit of peace. Or maybe you thought, maybe if I have more power in my life. Or what if I were someone famous? Then I'd have peace. But you take a look at the lives that are very public. They don't seem to have much peace because they're famous. And he will be their peace. Now, back in the booth, I see you're kind of looking down. Don't look down. I need Micah 5 up here. Can you find that in the PowerPoint and click that up here for me? Because we've got to take a look at this. We've got all this uh, trouble in the nation, and then we have this promise. If you would put up the verse 2 for me. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, who, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Take a look at that. Several things here. Again, the different prophets have different glimpses of the future. And here it says this promise of God will come out of Bethlehem Ephrathah, the little town of Bethlehem. Oh, and at that point, it was really small. In fact, I don't know if your families have things they say, you know, like, oh, nothing good could come out of that section of town, or nothing good could come out of that city, or that region of the country. Well, in those days, it was nothing good could ever come out of Bethlehem. It was considered the worst place to live in Israel. And here, this is the place that the Savior would be born. And then it says there near the end of the verse, whoops, back one, thank you, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. We get different clues. You see, when Jesus is born, it's not the beginning of his existence because he comes from of old. In fact, in other parts of the Bible, we learn that he is there at the time of creation, that creation happens through him. Now the next verse. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time. Uh, it, it's not all good news. See, they were going to be exiled. Okay, exiled. <laughs> but then they come back just in time for the one who would give birth to the son. And that son will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. Let's finish that verse 4. In the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. That imagery is throughout Scripture that he would be a shepherd. He would care for his flock. We know from the Bible that we are his flock. You are his people. And he cares for you in every aspect of your life. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. And in fact, you know, starting in Bethlehem, his greatness does reach even to Saginaw. There's that line. In the midst of what I described at the time of Micah, and that message is for us today, in the midst of the time we find ourselves, and he will be their peace. You have that whole idea of a peace treaty. We talk about wars and things like that. Well, you know, peace treaties are, are really good. They, they mean the war is over, right? So you have this treaty, and usually it's one, one group or a nation is victorious over another, and they come in and they describe the terms of peace. So you have to, you know, give up your treasures or property, or you have to give up your rights or something to that victor nation. So it's the end of a conflict. Well, this peace that we have from God is the end of a conflict. It's the conflict that sin created 
between us and God, and He is the victor because He keeps His bargain and we do not. So then He comes in, okay, as the victor, and declares the terms of peace. Now think about it for a minute in human terms. Basically, your surrender, and he's going to describe to you what you have to do to have peace with him. And he comes into the negotiations and he says this, okay, first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to send my son Jesus. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. He's going to grow up, and he will go to the cross and shed his blood for you for your forgiveness so that your relationship, that conflict is over now. The peace treaty is signed in his blood so that you will have peace. not at all like the normal peace agreements that come, is it? God promises to do all the work, to pay the price, so that your sins would be forgiven, and that when He rose victorious, you too will rise victorious in Him. So that's what makes it possible when you see somebody experiencing trial. How possible is it then? See, you know, you visit somebody who has stage 4 cancer and they have peace. Why? Why? Because they know their sins are forgiven. Or for the person who's made a wreck of this life and the wreck, a wreck of the lives of everyone around them, how could they possibly have peace? Because their sins are forgiven. How is it possible for you to have joy, contentment, and satisfaction coming into this Christmas time? How can you have any peace if your health is bad, your finances are bad, your personal life is in bad shape? Because peace is Jesus. Because you know you know that He loves you. Because you know that He went to the cross for you. And because you know He's working out all things for your good. You know, I get to the end of a sermon and I always end it the same way. Now the peace of God, which passes all our understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I, and I, I, I got to tell you, I mean, I always get to the end and I, I have this thought, I should think of something new. I should come up with a different way to end it. Instead of quoting that particular scripture, just, just make something up. You know, something that would be really good. But that has it. I mean, we declare this promise that Micah declared a long time ago every week. And, you know, I know I grew up here in it. My dad's a pastor, and every time he preached, he ended with those same words. My grandpa ended every one of his sermons with those same words. I never got to hear my great-grandpa preach, but I'm told he ended with those words also. So maybe it's just genetic Maybe it's just a habit, generational habit. But it doesn't rely on that, see? It doesn't rely on the person, me, or anybody. It relies on Jesus Christ. And the reminder is every week, and now the peace of God that passes all our understanding. See, because it's just, it's just not the same. It's not the same as some sort of peace agreement you and I have with somebody else. It's a peace agreement that we did nothing for, that God established, and He establishes it in His Son, Jesus Christ. So once again, as we look forward this week to the celebration, 
of the incredible birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. And now, the peace of our God, which passes all our understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.